We're in 1 Corinthians 8 today and week two of this series that we're calling All in Good Conscience. So just to recap, if you were not here last week, we looked at what the entire Bible teaches about our conscience, which we define according to God's word. I'll put it up here on the screen just as a recap. Conscience is your sense of what you believe is right and wrong. We talked about how your conscience is personal. Like no one's conscience is exactly the same as another, and how your conscience as a result is imperfect. Nobody's got the perfect conscience, and your conscience can change. It can become better or worse, how it needs calibration in alignment with God's word and God's spirit and humble learning from and selfless love for others. We talked about how a good, clean conscience is critical to intimacy with God and success in life and unity in the church, and mission in the world, and living and dying for what matters most. Like a good, clean conscience is really, really important. And we talked about how Jesus is our only hope for a clean conscience, and Jesus is the only way to a good conscience. And then we close with the first two questions that we need to ask if we want to live every day with a good, clean conscience. As we make decisions every day, some small, some, spi some big, the first question we need to always ask, so toward a good, clean conscience, is what does the Bible say? And whenever or wherever God has spoken clearly, we need to align our conscience with his word. But the Bible is not always specifically clear on exactly what we need to do in every situation. I think about a really hard, significant decision to make in my life this last week. And I didn't have a clear word from God in the Bible about what to do. And I was agonizing, no exaggeration, in tears, just begging for help from God's Spirit to know what to do. Or I think about a, a group of students that I was meeting with this last week to talk about dating and marriage. And we looked at what the Bible says about marriage and we had a really good discussion about how that affects whether or who we might date. Knowing the Bible doesn't say date or don't date at this age. The Bible doesn't name the exact person you are to marry. So on this and countless other issues, we don't have a specific word from God. So then we need to ask a second question. And that question is, what does my conscience say? So what do I sense as best as I can based on God's word and God's spirit that I should think or desire or do in a particular situation. And we said that most people, if they even ask these questions, stop here. Okay, what does the Bible say? What does my conscience say? Okay, that's what I'm gonna do. But the problem is, if these are the only questions we ask, then we're not gonna have a good, clean conscience. And we're gonna miss intimacy with God and true success in life and unity in the church, and mission in the world. And we're gonna miss living for what matters most. In fact, if you only ask these questions, you may actually experience distance from God. And you may contribute to disunity in the church. And you may hinder the spread of the gospel in the world. Because that's exactly what was happening in the church at Corinth. Let me show you this in 1 Corinthians chapter eight. So follow along with me there, starting in verse one. The Bible says, oops. Now concerning food offered to idols, we know that all of us possess knowledge. This knowledge puffs up, but love builds up. If anyone imagines that he knows something, he does not yet know as he ought to know. But if anyone loves God, he is known by God. Now we're gonna read the whole chapter today, but let me stop right here and just point out from the very beginning how what God is saying in these verses is so needed in our world, especially in the church world today. Like it is possible, this passage is saying, to have knowledge. Just look at how many times knowledge is mentioned. All of us possess knowledge, this Knowledge puffs up. If anyone imagines that he knows something, he does not yet know as he ought to know. If anyone loves God, he is known by God. And we find out later that this knowledge he's talking about here involves 
conviction about a matter of conscience. And the Bible is saying it is good to have knowledge that leads you to conviction about all kinds of things. But the Bible is saying at the same time, you can have knowledge and conviction based on that knowledge, but that knowledge can so puff you up that you forget to build others up in love. And church family, this is so relevant for us today. We live in a world, and even a church world, and when I use that term, just to clarify, when I say church world, I'm talking about the broader church culture that we are swimming in that inevitably affects us as a local church family within it. We live in a church world where people hold so tightly to their convictions based on knowledge that we assume we have that we forget how to build one another up in love. So I want to illustrate this by bringing four of our pastors here to our Tyson's location out here on stage with me. So they're going to Join me back here. I'll uh, introduce you to them just to make sure some of you at Tyson's and maybe some of the other locations know some of these brothers, but I assume not everybody does. So over here is Carly Lundy. So Carly has Haitian background. Uh, he and his family moved up here from Florida a couple years ago and started serving in a variety of different capacities in the church and just cared for people so well. So we brought him on uh, this last year, just fully stepping into a uh, role as pastor here. So that's Carly. Then James Park behind me uh, has served here as pastor for a number of years. Uh, so, so many things come to my mind when I think about James. His love, care for people, and, so here's what's coming to my mind. It's staff meetings. Uh, we'll, we'll sometimes send in pictures of family stuff or videos from family stuff. And one of the highlights of COVID over this last year was seeing James and Esther Park and their family doing a lip sync to a Little Mermaid song, I Want to Be Where the People Are. And it was, it was beautiful. So uh, anyway, uh, sorry, James. Now everybody, when you think about James Park, you're going to do that, Little Mermaid. So yeah, that's, that's James. So then, uh, then Chris Lowe, one of our, actually our newest pastor at uh, NBC Tyson's. So Chris is a former college football quarterback, uh, coached high school football after that. And then the Lord called him and his wife, Anna, to move overseas for the spring of the gospel among the unreached, has spent a number of years uh, making disciples, multiplying churches in unreached places around the world, and then just over the last year moved back, and the Lord led him and Anna and their six kids here to be a part of our church family, so welcome Chris Lowe. And then Nate uh, over here, who is our location pastor, has been at NBC forever, um, and uh, just got home this last week with uh, a new little boy from India that they adopted. So anyway, that gives you a picture of these, these brothers. So one Sunday last fall, I brought up four other people and I gave them each ropes. And they stood in a circle and they held onto those ropes as a picture of what it means to be together in the church. So I'm gonna ask these guys to do that same thing again. And Really, I'd actually prefer not to use ropes for this illustration. It'd be better if they were just holding hands, but we're still going COVID style. So we'll use the ropes. And I, when I brought four guys up here and I mentioned, I started to talk about four specific friends of mine that they kind of stood for. Four friends who are leaders in the church in different churches, followers of Jesus, who've had a significant impact on my life. Yet each of these guys has very dim different perspectives on a variety of things. I would say on a variety of important things. And on that Sunday, I said that we live in a church world that is pitting these brothers in Christ against one another. And I should add a church world that's pitting me, either for or against different ones of them. It all depends on which blog or post you're looking at. It's all supercharged, raising everything to the level of a gospel issue that we need to draw swords and divide over in the church. And I, I should say, if you're unaware of what I'm talking about, Please know, there is absolutely no need for you to go online and try to figure out what I'm talking about. Just, just keep following Jesus and leading people to Jesus. Like, that's, that's what we should be doing. So, but I said on that Sunday last fall, we live in a church world that wants to divide Christians into different camps. Are you with this guy or with that guy? Knowing these guys definitely don't believe the same thing about everything. And I definitely don't agree with any of these guys about everything. 
But I said, each of these brothers, I am confident, loves Jesus, loves his word, would agree with the foundations of what we believe in this church family, and they all want to make the gospel known in the world. They're giving their lives to that. So I said, may it be crystal clear at NBC that despite various disagreements, even strong disagreements, we're going to be a church in this world that holds on to these ropes. We're not going to throw rocks at each other. We're going to hold ropes, which means we're not going to think about the same thing about everything, but we're going to choose not to divide over those disagreements when we agree on what matters most. Now, here's the challenge, and here's where this whole picture goes awry. When knowledge and conviction based on that knowledge starts to puff up, to use language from 1 Corinthians 8, to the point where people hold so strongly to their convictions that they let go of love for each other. So here's what I want to do. I want to puff these guys up in a few different ways. So we'll start with Carly here. We're going to have Carly be puffed up with theological knowledge. This brother is stout, puffed up with theological knowledge. Like he knows he's got Calvinism figured out. He's got spiritual gifts figured out. He knows how the end times are going to shake out. And if you disagree with him, just be ready. He has centuries worth of historical church debates and scores of end times charts to put you in your place. And to the point where if you don't believe what he believes about these issues in theology, he wonders if you actually even believe the Bible. So that's Carly. James, the little mermaid over here. <laughs> Sorry, bro. James is puffed up with knowledge about COVID. Now, to be fair, this could go either direction. So we're just going to let it be ambiguous. So you're, you're not going to know which side he's on. But he has a lot of knowledge about how either masks are helpful or absurd. He has a lot of knowledge about the effectiveness of social distancing or the ridiculousness of social distancing. And he has deep convictions about vaccines based on a lot of data. That's James. Then we have Chris over here. So since we're hitting close to home, why not just go for it? Chris, new to DC, but this brother is passionate about, or puffed up with political knowledge. So he thinks deeply about political issues, about issues of politics, justice, race, has, again, we can go different directions here, just kind of leave it open. So he has very deep convictions about how we as a nation should or should not be talking about issues of justice, race, politics. His convictions are born out of deep personal experiences in his life, and a lot of time he has spent thinking through those things. He's puffed up with a lot of political knowledge. And then, Nate Reed, our location pastor over here, he, along the way, has gotten, since nobody else is holding a rope with you, why not? He has gotten puffed up with knowledge about social issues in the Christian life. Social issues in the sense of, should a Christian drink alcohol or not drink alcohol? Should a Christian smoke a cigar or not smoke a cigar? And again, we'll leave it open so that you don't picture Nate in a particular way. Either he is passionate about drinking alcohol in moderation or, drinking a, or smoking a cigar periodically on his back porch. Or he thinks anybody who drinks alcohol, smokes a cigar, is clearly not serious about their relationship with Christ and the temple of the Holy Spirit and their body. So I, I give you a picture in these four brothers. And obviously these are just four examples. And there are multitudes more. But people can get puffed up over 
entertainment choices, parenting philosophies, schooling choices, financial debt, how the church relates to the government, whether we should celebrate Easter, whether we should celebrate Christmas, all kinds of issues. And it's not that knowledge about these issues informed by God's word isn't important. To be clear, it absolutely is. But what I hope is obvious at this point is these guys can't hold a rope with each other if their priority is holding to these convictions that are matters of conscience in their own lives. And what's worse is we live in a world where we're constantly encouraged to hold tighter and tighter to those convictions. We live in echo chambers where we surround ourselves with people who think just like us and reinforce the way we're thinking. We spend countless hours on social media not realizing that media is digitally designed to manipulate the way we think, to tell us what we want to hear. Down to the very news we consume, we have different versions of that. So we live in a world that's puffing up our individual convictions and pitting us against those with different convictions. This is what social media thrives on. It's the way it's designed. So you know what the world is doing. If these guys can get a little closer to each other. The world is saying, <laughs> you don't want to be near that guy. Like, look, they're just going at it on their own. I was going to keep pushing them, but it's not even needed. <laughs> But I want you to get the picture here. Like the world is like, that guy's dangerous over there. Like he doesn't even believe the Bible. <laughs> is, he even, is he even a Christian? They're an enemy of the church. Like I wish the language I'm using right now was an exaggeration, but it's not. It's what's happening in the world, in the church world we are in. And I want to propose, based on 1 Corinthians chapter 8, that there's another way God is calling us to live that doesn't involve compromising your convictions on matters like these, but that does involve loving other Christians who have different convictions on matters like these. So if I could ask these guys to take off these puffed up convictions, if they're able to, and instead, Exchange them for the same picture of their convictions. So the Bible's not saying just forget about your convictions. Forget about knowing things that inform your convictions. No, have knowledge. Have convictions based on those. But as they get dressed back here, the question is, is there a way for them to have those convictions while still holding on to the ropes. And I want to submit that it's not just possible, but it's God's design for us to have convictions based on knowledge while holding on to love for each other in the church. A kind of love that listens to each other's perspectives with honor for each other and maybe comes to different conclusions than each other. But in the end, looks at each other in the eyes and says, I think so differently than you do about the end times and masks and vaccines and what is or isn't racism or politically wise or whether we should drink or smoke a cigar. But I know you love Jesus and his word. And you're my brother sister in Christ, and I'm going to live to build you up. This is what God is calling the church to do. And it's what God was calling the church at Corinth to do. So would you thank these guys with me? So I want you to, I want you to get the picture. Like what we just illustrated in the church today is unfortunately nothing new. Like it was happening 2,000 years ago. Thankfully, not in the middle of a pandemic and not with social media, but the church at Corinth was dividing like this. I'm with Paul. I'm with Apollos. I'm with Peter. And they had totally dropped the rope. And specifically here in 1 Corinthians 8, their knowledge that led to conviction based on matters of conscience had so puffed them up 
that they had lost love for each other. And they were tearing each other down. The Bible says, the word it uses is they were destroying each other. Now, the specific difference of conviction and conscience in 1 Corinthians 8 dealt with food that had been sacrificed to idols. So let me take you back a couple thousand years ago to first century Corinth in ways that will help us understand what God is saying to us today in the 21st century. So the city of Corinth was filled with temples dedicated to different idols, to false gods. And those temples were the center of social life in the city. So banquets, gatherings, meetings, celebrations would happen at these temples. And they would be mainly, many times, social events, not always explicitly religious events. And these temples didn't just dominate the social landscape, they were central for food production, particularly meat. Most of the meat that Corinthians would eat was initially butchered by priests in one of these temples in the context of idolatry. And then some of the meat would be served there at the temple. Picture the temple almost like a restaurant where you would go out to eat. Then leftover meat that wasn't used in the restaurant would be sold in the marketplace for people to then take and eat in their homes. So the question in 1 Corinthians 8 is, should Christians eat meat in the temple of an idol? Should a Christian go to a banquet or a work meeting or a family celebration or basically a restaurant at a temple and eat food when that food is technically a part of idol worship in that place? Now, I'll go ahead and tell you the the Bible scholars actually disagree on how, how 1 Corinthians 8 answers that question. Like some Bible scholars think the Bible's saying, no way, you should never eat food in the temple. Other scholars, traditionally most scholars, think the Bible is saying it's possible to eat food in that temple. I think it's kind of ironic that in a passage about conscience that there are different understandings of how to understand this particular text. But I land on the latter picture with traditionally most scholars because of the way 1 Corinthians 8 is written. So I wanna show you in this chapter two really important truths that we need to realize that lead to two really important takeaways for our lives today. So two truths, two takeaways based on 1 Corinthians chapter eight. I'll put them on the screen and I wanna show them where they show you where they come from in God's word. First truth, truth number one, followers of Jesus all agree on the foundation of our faith, according to God's word. Every word there matters. Let me say it again. Followers of Jesus all agree on the foundation of our faith, according to God's word. So after talking about how knowledge puffs up, but love builds up, the Bible says, therefore, as to the eating of food offered to idols, we know that an idol has no real existence, and there is no God but one. Now we know when the Bible's talking about knowledge here, it's clear this is something every follower of Jesus knows, that there is one true God, which means that false gods are not God. They are, idols are empty. So you keep going in verse five. For although there may be so-called gods in heaven or on earth, they're so-called, as indeed there are many gods and many lords, in quotation, Marks, we know for us there is one God, the Father from whom all things and for whom we exist. So there's one God who has made all of us. He's the one we live for or from whom and we live for him. And one Lord, Jesus Christ. A powerful declaration here that Jesus is God through whom are all things and through whom we exist. So let me just pause here and speak particularly to those of you who may be exploring Christianity. Because the verses we just read, and specifically this verse on the screen right here, in a sense summarizes the core foundation of Christianity. Every one of us has been created by God for God. To walk with, you have been created to walk with and enjoy and worship God forever and ever in your life. But, the problem is all of us have sinned against God. We've turned from God and his ways to ourselves in our own ways. We've not lived for God in every facet of our lives. We've sinned against God. All of us have. 
And as a result of our sin, we are separated from God. And if we die in this state of sin, separation from God, we will spend eternity separated from God in judgment due our sin. But the good news of the Bible is that God loves us. And God has come to us in the person of Jesus Christ, who has done what we all need. He lived a perfect life of no sin, and then even though he had no sin for which to die, he chose to die on a cross to pay the price for the sins of anyone who would trust in him. Then he rose from the grave in victory over sin and death. So that anyone, anywhere, no matter who you are or what you've done, if you will trust in Jesus to save you from your sin, that's what his name means, the one who saves us from our sins, a Savior and Lord of your life, if you will put your trust in Jesus, God will forgive you of all of your sins and restore you to relationship with him forever. If you have never been restored to relationship God with God through faith in Jesus, I invite you to do that today. I've prayed that God would bring people today to hear that for that purpose. Like this is the moment where you can be forgiven of all your sin, restored to relationship with God for all of eternity. And then when you do, and for all who have, these truths that I just shared, that are reflected here in 1 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 6, form the foundation that unites all followers of Jesus. And this is so important. Like even in thinking about talking about unity in the church or differences of conviction, we need to be clear. We're not talking about differences in foundation. Like if you deny that Jesus is God or that he died on the cross or rose from the dead, or if you believe that your works get you to heaven instead of faith, trust, and work of Jesus, then you're not a follower of Jesus. You're not standing on the foundation. Every follower of Jesus knows and believes these things, has banked their lives on these things. According to the Bible, that's why I put in this first truth, according to God's word, in parentheses there, because if we just say followers of Jesus all agree on the foundation of our faith, you might ask, well, who determines what the foundation is? And the answer is, God does in his word. The Bible teaches, and so we believe, there is one God, the Father, from whom are all things, for whom we exist, and one Lord, Jesus Christ, through whom are all things, and through whom we exist. In other words, Jesus is our life. He's our Lord. And to be clear, these are not just truths in a Christian's head. These truths transform our hearts and every facet of our lives. This is what it means to be a follower of Jesus. Now, with that foundation then, that first truth, we all agree on the foundation of our faith according to God's word, truth number two. Followers of Jesus often disagree on the application of that foundation to specific situations according to our conscience. So again, every word there is so important. Followers of Jesus often disagree on the application of that foundation. So standing on the same foundation, but then applying the lordship of Jesus to this or that specific situation in life, there may be disagreement according to different people's consciences. And that is what 1 Corinthians chapter eight, as best as I can tell, is addressing. Like verse seven says, however, not all possess this knowledge now, as soon as we, the Bible uses knowledge here, we've moved beyond knowledge about the foundation of our faith that unites followers of Jesus to knowledge that leads to conviction about matters of conscience where followers of Jesus differ. And we know that because there were different perspectives among Christians in Corinth over whether or not to eat this food in the temple. Listen to what the Bible says. But some, but, so here's, the, here's some contrast here. In the church, some, through former association with idols, eat food as really offered to an idol, and their conscience, being weak, is defiled. So follow that. There are some Christians, not all, some, who used to participate in idolatry in those temples. And they used to think about eating in those temples as a form of worship to those idols. So if they eat that food in that temple now, 
it feels a lot like they're worshiping those idols all over again. It feels like it's really offered to an idol. And as a result, they're defiling their conscience by eating that food. But not everybody feels, thinks like that. Think, for example, about many Jewish Christians in Corinth who even before they came to faith in Jesus, they still believed there was only one God. They had never eaten food in a temple like it was an act of worship to an idol. It's been nothing more than a social event for them. And Paul writes in the next verse, verse eight, food will not commend us to God. We are no worse off if we do not eat and no better off if we do. In other words, for many of you, eating this food doesn't seem like disobedience or false worship to you. So do you see the difference here? You have two Christians who both believe there is one God, Jesus is Lord of their lives, they agree on the foundation of their faith according to God's word, but they disagree on the application of that foundation to this specific situation, in this case, whether to eat food in a temple. Their consciences are calibrated differently. For one Christian, they cannot in good conscience eat that food without feeling like they're dishonoring God and worshiping an idol. And for them, it is a spiritual battle. It's a fight not to eat that food. While for another Christian, it's totally different. And they're fine to eat that food in good conscience. So they agree on the foundation of God's word. They disagree on the application of that foundation to a specific situation where their consciences are calibrated differently. And like we said last week, we said again this week, There are so many situations where followers of Jesus, even this gathering right now, all the places where we are, we have differences of conviction on matters of conscience, whether theological or medical or political or social or any number of other things. So listen to what the Bible says next, specifically to the person whose conscience gives them freedom to eat that food in the temple. God says, but take care. Oh, what a great command. Be careful. Take care. Take care that this right of yours, this freedom you feel, does not somehow become a stumbling block to the weak. For if anyone sees you who have knowledge, this knowledge leads to your conviction eating in an idol's temple, Will he not be encouraged if his conscience is weak to eat food offered to idols? In other words, your brother over here who was saved out of this idolatry, he's in a battle to keep from eating that food. When he sees you eating it, he'll be encouraged to eat it in a way that leads him to go against his conscience, to fall back into the pattern of idolatry that he's been saved from. And God says, so by your knowledge... This weak person is destroyed, the brother for whom Christ died. Like what, a, what a word God chooses to use. He says, you, with all your knowledge and your conviction, you're not building up your brother in love. You're destroying your brother who thinks differently from you. And not just that. You're not destroying him. You're dishonoring Jesus, verse 12. Thus sinning against your brothers, wounding their conscience when it is weak, you sin against Christ himself. Which is why Paul, who's writing this under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, concludes in verse 13. Therefore, if food makes my brother stumble, I will never eat meat, lest I make my brother stumble. Paul says, even if I feel complete freedom to eat that food in that temple, like I can in good conscience eat the food. Paul says, I won't do it if it won't build up my brother over here. I love my brother too much and I will not lead him to sin. So, what do we take away from this? What is God calling us to do in our lives today? Takeaway number one, humbly live according to your convictions. 
Please notice in this chapter that God is not saying to forget about your convictions or throw your conscience out the door. On the contrary, this chapter is saying to both followers of Jesus in this situation, live according to your conscience, your sense of what is right and wrong, and do so with humility. I love the language in those early verses in chapter 8. Look back at verse 2, talking about this knowledge that puffs up. Verse 2 says, if anyone imagines that he knows something, he does not yet know as he ought to know. That's a good word. It's a humble reminder to each one of us that none of us has it all figured out. You don't have it all figured out. I don't have it all figured out. If we think we have it figured out, we're imagining. Which means that, oh, please hear this. As followers of Jesus, we hold tightly to the foundation of our faith. There is one God. His name is Jesus. He is Savior and Lord. And salvation in him is by grace alone, through faith alone in him. We hold tightly to this foundation. But we don't hold as tightly to where we eat our food. Don't hold as tightly to how you think about the end times are going to shake out. Or how you reconcile divine sovereignty and human responsibility. Or the efficacy of masks or vaccines. Or your political calculations on various positions. Or your view of alcohol or cigars. And a multitude of other things you may be passionate about. Yes, have convictions based on knowledge and live accordingly, but do so humbly, realizing you don't have all these things figured out. And as you humbly live according to your convictions, take away number two, humbly love others with different convictions. So they have a different view of the end times or masks and vaccines or they approach things from a different political perspective. Or they smoke a cigar every once in a while. Or they don't ever think you should. Regardless, humbly love other followers of Jesus who have convictions on matters of conscience that are different from yours. Always consider how you can build them up. How you can keep them from stumbling. This is what God is calling us to today. So now we have a third question to add to where we left off last week. As we make decisions in our lives, small ones, big ones, with a good, clean conscience, that's gonna involve asking first, what does the Bible say? And where the Bible speaks clearly, align your conscience with God's word, period. No questions asked. But when the Bible isn't clear on exactly what you need to do, then ask, what does my conscience say? What do I sense as best as I can, based on God's word and God's spirit, that I should think or desire or do in this situation? But then, before you act, ask a third question. What will the effect be on other Christians? Specifically, how can I best build up my brother or sister in Christ in love and keep them from stumbling? And even if my conscience says one thing, I will do something different if my action would cause my brother or sister in Christ to stumble. Fourth question to come next week, Lord willing. But let me close with this pastoral encouragement for all of us based on what I would say are my two favorite phrases in this chapter. So the first is at the end of verse 11. So by your knowledge, the weak person is destroyed. The brother for whom Christ died. Like those last six words are so powerful, aren't they? The brother or sister for whom Christ died. Like church family, let's, let's see each other with this label. 
He's not that. She's not this and this camp or that group. Let's see each other this way. He or she is a brother, sister, like a family member for whom Christ laid down his life. Jesus loved them so much. He lost his life for them. And in seeing each other this way, Lord willing, we'll grow to love each other in ways that lead us to lay down our lives for each other. This is what Christian community is, what the church is. And then all the way back up in verse three, we read, but if anyone loves God, he is known by God. Is that not an awesome phrase? Like Paul takes this word, no, and he turns it completely on his head. He says, you want to talk about knowledge? God knows you. Like I was meditating on that reality this week. It's one of those moments when I'm, I'm studying, thinking through how to best help you based on God's word, teaching this passage. But it was one of those moments where it just, whoa, hit me personally in a fresh way. Like God knows me. And if I could just be a little vulnerable, I, I think about, I started thinking about how ever since I wrote a book about 10 plus years ago that a lot of people read and since then have received just criticism on a whole other level from people in the public sphere, I've thought over and over again about those who criticize me and I've thought if they only knew all that God knows about me, they would have so much more reason to criticize me. So much. I mean, the things they're criticizing me for aren't even true. If they knew the truth about every thought and motive I've had, everything I've done, like, I'd be sunk. But that's the wonder and the beauty here. Like, God does know me and he loves me. God knows everything about me, including all the times I've gone against his word and my conscience and all the times I've looked out for myself instead of others. God knows the worst things about me and he loves me. And I just want to leave you with that truth to encourage you today. If you're not a Christian, I want to encourage you God knows everything about you. And he loves you. And right now, like right now, if you will put your faith in Jesus and his love for you, he, God will wipe away every sin from the record of your life. And he will restore you to relationship with him, to know and enjoy him for all of eternity. And if you are a Christian, then be encouraged today. I don't know all that's going on in your life, but, and I don't know everything you've ever done, but the beauty is, I just wanna remind you, God knows everything about you. He knows everything about your past, your present, and he loves you so much. Just let that soak in wherever you are sitting right now. God, we're talking about God. He knows everything about you, and he loves you. And this, 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 I believe, is what enables us to hold the ropes in hard days. Just knowing that not one of us deserves to be here. But God knows and loves you, me, us as his own. And that is reason for worship. And that's reason to love as we have been loved. Would you bow your heads with me? Here in this room, other locations, wherever you are online, just pause as the Holy Spirit speaking to your heart. I would just ask you, like, do 
you know God like this? Do you, do you know the love of God in your life? Do you know Jesus is Lord of your life? And if the answer to that question is not a resounding yes in your heart, then I invite you right now, this is that moment, to put your faith in Jesus, just to say to God, just in your heart to say to him right now, God, I know that I have sinned against you, that I've turned aside from you. But today I believe that Jesus died on the cross for my sin. He rose from the dead and he's Lord. And so today I ask you to forgive me of my sin. Be Lord of my life. Restore me to relationship with you. And you express that to God in faith. The Bible says he will forgive you of all your sin. You say, just like that, just by trusting in him? Don't I have to do anything? No, that's the beauty. You say, that's too good to be true. It's true. God loves you. Trust in his love for you. Be forgiven of your sin today. Be restored to God today. And for all who have, all who are known, loved by God and Jesus, let's just pray, God, to help us. Help us to hold fast to the foundation of our faith. And God, we pray that you would help us to live out of the overflow of that foundation in ways that glorify you and in ways that are good for others. God, we pray, especially in the day that we are living in. But we realize, we've just seen it in your word. It's not altogether that different from 2,000 years ago. So help us, help us to build one another up in love. And please guide all of our convictions. We need your help. Help us, help us to think wisely about all these different things in the world. And help us to love one another in the church when we have some different convictions as we cling in the middle of it all to you, Jesus, as we cling to you. We love you, Jesus. We love your word. We love your Holy Spirit in us. And we are so thankful to be a part of your church. We shudder to think where we would be without your grace and your mercy. Thank you for knowing us and loving us like you do. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.